I know it's kind of rainy and yucky out there, but um, that's okay. It's dry in here, right? I think. Y'all seen anything? I think it's dry in here. All right, that's good news. So good to see everybody out tonight. Um, if you don't like the weather tonight, that's okay. Wait till tomorrow, and it'll be even better. Um, so uh, I saw the forecast for the next 10 days uh, after this little front comes through, and it's my kind of weather. 20s and 30s for the lows and 40s and 50s for the highs. Woo! I'm excited about that. So uh, that sounds good. Kill some bugs. All right. Anyway, listen, it's good to see you all tonight. And um, we do, for those of you who have joined online, thank you so much for being here. I do want to let you know that uh, service will be a little bit shorter tonight because we have a business meeting after our Bible study. Um, but we want to encourage you and thank you for being here. We begin tonight to uh, our study on Nehemiah. We finished up last week in Ezra, and so we will begin tonight in Nehemiah. We're going to cover a little background on Nehemiah before we really dig into the scriptures, so I don't know how far we'll get into the first chapter tonight, but we'll, we'll go till we run out of time, okay? So let's go ahead and open up with a word of prayer, and then we'll uh, dig into the meal that God has set before us tonight. Father, we thank you so much for all the blessings that you do pour out upon us. Father, we're so glad to be able to be in your house. Father, what a blessing that it is to even be here tonight. Father, we pray that you will keep people safe as they travel to and fro. And Father, most of all, we just pray that tonight as we uh, break your bread of, of your word, Father, that you would just feed us in such a way that we would be full. That, Father, we would understand the things that we see tonight and you would just touch us in ways that perhaps we haven't seen it before. Father, again, we just give you the glory for all of these things, and we ask it in the precious name of our Savior Jesus. Amen. 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 All right. Well, we're going to jump right over into uh, Nehemiah, so you can turn over to Nehemiah. And if you had your place held for Ezra, it's that, the next door, uh, the very next chapter, so the very next book. So uh, you can turn over to that. And uh, as I said, um, there's a few things that I want to talk about before we dive right in. Um, does anybody know, um, before Nehemiah came to build the wall, does anybody know what he was doing before that? Anybody? Nehemiah was the cupbearer to the king of Persia. He was the cupbearer to the king of Persia, and he lived in the palace in Persia. And um, so it was... Um, about a thousand years after the time of Moses and about 400 years before the birth of Jesus when the nation of Israel and the Jewish people were in terrible state. They were in a terrible, terrible state. Their nations were destroyed. The first, uh, the northern Jewish kingdom of Israel and then secondly, the J southern Jewish kingdom of Judah. They were completely destroyed and conquered by the Babylonians and the temple of Solomon was destroyed. Um, so for about 70 years, uh, Jerusalem was kind of a ghost town. And uh, there weren't that many people there, but um, God had not forgotten it. So when the Jews were deported to Babylon, they began to make homes for themselves there. They started settling down, making a new place. And um, many of them actually prospered and did well in Babylon. Some of the Jews were faithful, and they actually got uh, raised up into positions of authority and power in the government. Uh, think of Daniel. Think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Think of them. Um, they actually were taken into exile, but they were risen into power. Um, but about uh, 70 years after that, they were given the opportunity to return to Jerusalem. And we started talking about that in the book of Ezra. Now, I want to remind you that out of approximately 2 to 3 million Jews that had been taken into captivity out of their homeland that were living in um, Babylon at the time, only approximately 50,000 of them decided to return to Jerusalem. So just imagine that now. Two to three million Jews taken out of their promised land and moved to Babylon and they're so comfortable in their exile in Babylon that they don't want to return back to Jerusalem. So 50, approximately 50,000, that's like 2%. 2% of the Jews that were taken into exile decided they want to go back to the promised land that God had given them. That's just incredible to me to think about that. But they did return, and in, in Ezra's day, they rebuilt the temple, and they laid a foundation, a spiritual foundation for Israel again. So tonight, the book of Nehemiah begins approximately 15 years after the book of Ezra ends. 
It's about 100 years after the first captives came back to the promised land. So <clears throat> the citizens of Jerusalem before this had tried to rebuild the walls, but they had failed. They had been stopped by their enemies. They had been stopped by all kinds of problems. And so they had not been able to rebuild the walls. Nobody really thought that was going to be something that they could overcome because of all the problems that they were having. So now we're in Nehemiah. We're going to look in chapter t uh, 1, beginning in uh, verses 1 through 3. Okay. So Nehemiah, it says in, in uh, 1 through 3, it says, The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, it came to pass in the month of Chislev in the 20th year, as I was in Sushan, the citadel that Hananiah, one of my brethren, came with men from Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, The survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down, and its gates are burned with fire. Now remember, this is about 15 years after the book of Ezra ended. Now the book of Ezra ended, um, they were... Uh, he was upset with the people and they were trying to get right, right? They were changing, trying to do things. So about 15 years later, now Nehemiah is asking, what is the condition of the promised land? Now, Nehemiah had never lived in Jerusalem. Nehemiah came along after they were put into exile, so he had never lived in Jerusalem. Um, but he still had a heart for Jerusalem. Now, where he was at uh, in the citadel, that means it's a fortified place. It's a fortified palace of the Persians. So you know right away Nehemiah was held in a in a high esteem. He was held in an important place. He was cupbearer to the king. You didn't get to do that just because you'd signed up and wanted to, right? You were elevated to that position. It was a very important position. It was a position in which you could have the king's ear. Um, so it was a very important position for Nehemiah to be in. So um, when he asked about the Jews and all of that, um, he heard some terrible news. Now, um, one of the commentators that, that I've been reading said Nehemiah's body was in Persia, but his heart was in Jerusalem. Even though he had not lived in Jerusalem, that's where his heart was. And so um, look with me to Psalms chapter 137, verses 5 through 6. Psalm 137, 5 through 6. I want you to see something there. Psalm 137. 5 and 6. 137, 5 and 6 says this, If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. If I do not remember you, let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I do not exalt Jerusalem above my chief joy, remember, O Lord, against the sons of Edom, the day of Jerusalem, who said, Raise it, raise it to its very foundation. So what we're saying here, in uh, I, I read it all the way through 7, but what we're saying here is that Nehemiah had that heart. That's the kind of heart he had for Jerusalem. He, he, even though he was not, he hadn't lived there, he had that heart for Jerusalem. Why? It's the center of the promised land that God had given the people. It was the place of the Jews. And so even though Nehemiah had not lived there, he had a heart for Jerusalem. And then he hears that the walls are broken down and the gates are burned with fire. They were still that way. They had never been repaired since the people were destroyed and moved to um, Babylon. It had never been repaired. So this was terrible news for him. It was a terrible thing because here's what it means for an unwalled city during that day. Uh, a walled city, the wall was the way the city was protected. The wall being around the city meant that it was a city worth protecting, that it was a, a, um, a good city. It was one that had a lot of worth, and so therefore there was a wall around it to be protected. To find out that the city had no wall around it made it seem as if it was um, uh, just a, a backwater town, one that nobody really cared that much about. It wasn't a big deal. It was just a, just a little blip on the highway, right? Wasn't anything to it. Well, of course, Jerusalem was more than that. Jerusalem was the center of the promised land. It was where the Jews were celebrating God. It's where they were worshiping. It's where the temple was. And so in all of this, it was, it was breaking his heart to hear that the city was unwalled. 
not only was it a terrible thing because it devalued the city in the eyes of the people during that time, but it also was something that caused the people to live in constant stress and tension because they never knew when they were going to come under attack. Now, we know in Ezra, Ezra had the authority and the, the word was sent out to the people around from the kingdom that don't mess with the city of Jerusalem. You help them, don't hurt them. All that was sent out. But listen, years had passed by. Years had passed by since all of that. And all those years that had passed by, the people that were once followers of the, the king, and uh, they weren't always doing the right thing anymore. They weren't always following what the king said. And so when we look in this position and we see these things, you got to know there was, there was stress because there was, you know, a potential for someone to come in and uh, defeat them and to steal things and do whatever. So they were always under stress. Um, so Nehemiah had a reaction to the news that he heard. When he heard all of that about how terrible it was and the walls are still torn down, the gates are burned, they're still living in this stress and this hard time. The city does not have the glory that it once had because the walls haven't even been replaced. So all of this had happened. So what kind of reaction did he have? Look at verse 4. <coughs> verse 4 says, So it was when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. So here's the thing. Again, Nehemiah, who had not lived in Jerusalem, but he had that heart for Jerusalem. It was part of who he was as a Jew. When he heard how terrible the situation was and the situation that the people were in, it literally broke his heart. It broke his heart. And he says, I sat down and wept. What that really means when it's translated is that he fell down. He lost all the strength in his legs and he just dropped, fell down to his knees because he couldn't even stand anymore. The, all, of the, all of his strength just went out of him. And he just dropped to his knees and began to weep and began to cry and mourn over the city of Jerusalem. He began to mourn over that. So what it made me think about when I read that was, when's the last time that something dealing directly with God caused you to just fall to your knees and bury your face and pray. When's the last time that happened? Thinking about the things of God and, and God's people and looking around at how God's people, what's going on today in this world. Look at the churches closing left and right. Look at all the stuff that's happening. Look at God's name being taken out of everything. All the things that are happening, when's the last time that it affected us so greatly that we literally fell on our face and cried and began to pray because we knew that this was not good? When was it that we, we did that? Listen, basically what we're talking about here is that he humbled himself. He fell down, he began to weep, and he mourned, and he mourned for many days. Now, the fact is that God had touched Nehemiah's heart because he was going to use him for something. He was going to use Nehemiah for something, but he had to prepare him first. He had to prepare him in order for him to be used. He mourned for many days. And so the real reality is that way before all of this, God had already begun to prepare Nehemiah because he put him in the position that he was in in Persia. He didn't get there accidentally. You know, the reality is when we look around today and we see that people are in certain positions and why did they get to be in those positions? What is it about them that, that put them in that position? And many times what we find out is it's not really them. How did they get there? There may be a purpose. You know, I know that everybody has their own football teams and all of that, and I don't know this young man personally. But I can tell you when I was watching the season this year and Alabama was playing and one of the first games that they played and, and it, they did well, and the reporters came and they shoved a microphone in the face of Bryce Young, the quarterback, and the first thing he said is, first of all, I have to give glory to God because I couldn't do anything without him. He has been prepared for a time such as that, that he would stand on a world stage and there would be media attention, putting a microphone in his face, and he would have an opportunity to give glory to God at that moment. God put him in that place, and who knows if it wasn't just for that reason, for that very reason. Do you know today we still there's still something that happens in football? They still call it this. They call it Tebowing. 
You know what that is? That he's going down on one knee and he's putting his head on his hand and he's praying. And because he did that without any shame and he did that in a public location on the media where everybody can see him, he was relentlessly teased and um, talked bad about and so many things because he did it. And you know what he did? He did it again. Every time that he took all that, he did it again. Why? Because he said, God put me in this place with this type of audience that I would be able to do this. Who knows when you're put in a position, did God put you there for a purpose to glorify him? Maybe that's the whole reason that this happened for you. We like to think sometimes it was just we got such a good thing because God just loves us so much and he wanted us to have all the good things. Listen, God puts us in places for a purpose. He put Nehemiah as the cupbearer for a purpose. He was preparing him way before this began. And when Nehemiah asked, why did he ask? It doesn't say that he ever had asked about any of this before. And yet there had been situations where perhaps he could have. He, when he asked about this and he got the word that the city was unwalled, that the, they were torn, the wall was torn down, the gates had been burned, everything was in distress. It tore up his heart. He fell and he mourned for many days because God had already prepared him. He prepared him for something. And so when we see the heart that Nehemiah had here, then we can understand that he was already prepared. Now, Something that you may or may not know in reading through the book of Nehemiah, the book of Nehemiah is all about leadership. It's all about leadership. Because did Nehemiah rebuild the wall by himself? He did not. He could not. He had no way that he could do it by himself. There was a task that God had given him, but he could not do it on his own. Listen, as, as Christians, as believers in Jesus Christ, there are times when God puts something on our heart that we know it's something God wants done. And we look at it and go, but how are we going to do this? I mean, I think we should do this, but how? How can we do this? Well, number one, we can't do it alone. Number one, God's got to be at the center of it. He's got to prepare us for it. He's going to use us, but we got to be willing to be used by him. We got to prepare ourselves if we want to see this happen. Maybe we're going to be the leader, but we have to be prepared Ourself. Leaders have to prepare themselves because it's not going to be easy. And leaders must also have a big vision. Nehemiah had a big vision. He had a really big vision because he wanted to go back and rebuild the wall and rebuild that city and get it back to where it was supposed to be. Why is that a big vision? Because it had not been able to happen in 150 years <coughs> since the Jews had returned. That still had not happened. It's a big vision. They had tried. Many had come before and tried, but it wasn't done. So it's a big vision of something that he wanted to do. He says in, in this chapter, he says, um, I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. In verse 4, he says that I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. So his reaction wasn't just simply an emotional reaction. His reaction drove him to something. The words that he received from God, it drove him to something. He fell down and he cried. He wept. He fell down and it said he wept and he prayed for many days and he was fasting. It went past an emotional reaction. He began to fast and all of this time he was looking for what it was that God wanted. He was fasting before the God of heaven and who the God of heaven Nehemiah understood 100% who he was fasting for. He was fasting for God, not just any God, but the God of heaven. He was fasting for the God of heaven, the one who created all of us, the one that the Jews knew was the true living God. He was fasting for him. He was fasting in all of that situation because he knew there was something that needed to be done. He had an emotional uh, connection to all of that but it wasn't just an emotional connection it was an emotion that caused him to absolutely humble himself and fall on his face and pray and fast to God for many days it says for many days that he did this he was literally pouring himself out before God because he knew something needed to be done he didn't know how and he didn't know who he just knew God wanted him to do something so again, I think about this, and I think about it in the context of today. I think about it in our context, in this world today. How many times 
do we absolutely understand God wants to use us and then we prepare for that by humbling ourselves, pouring out everything before God and saying, like uh, Isaiah said, here I am, send me. Here am I, send me. That's what he said, right? This is what Nehemiah is saying. He's pouring himself out to God and he's saying, something needs to be done. I'll go. I'll do it. Use me. Prepare me. I can be the one. But unfortunately, most of the time today, we say, you know, something ought to be done. Wonder who we can get to do that. Wonder who we can call. Something ought to be done. Y'all call the preacher. That's his job, right? We need this to happen. We need that to happen. All these things that come on our hearts and instead of being convicted to a point of action, too many times we are convicted, we have an emotional attachment and then it's gone. And nothing follows through with it. Nothing follows through. Nehemiah fell on his face, he prayed, he fasted, he waited for God to tell him what he needed to do. Look at verses 5 through 7. I'm trying to keep up with my time here. Okay. Verses 5 through 7. And I said, I pray, Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments, please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night, for the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Both my father's house and I have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, nor the ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. Here's the, the really neat thing about all of this. The really neat thing about all of this that we see here with Nehemiah is the prayer, which is essential. And it appears from what we can see, uh, it's actually over in chapter 2 of Nehemiah, but from what we can see, it appears that he spent the time praying approximately four months. Four months that he prayed and that he uh, sought God and all of the things that he did, there was four months before he did anything. He was spending that time in prayer. He was spending that time fasting. He was spending that, spending that time seeking what God wanted him to do. He prayed. He prayed to God, the God of heaven. He, he, he humbled himself and said, listen, you're the God of heaven. You're the God of heaven. I'm just a simple man. I'm just a, a, a creature that you created. And he humbled himself before God. He said, please hear me. The thing about humility is it also understands that we are completely dependent on God. Here's the, the thing. If you ask most people today, um, what are you dependent on? Nothing. I'm not dependent on anything. I don't depend on somebody else. I make my own way. I do my own things. I'm not dependent on something. Yes, you are. You may not know it, but you are. You're dependent on everything. The Bible says that apart from me, you can do nothing. So you're dependent on him. Nehemiah understood that. He was absolutely fully humble. He was fully dependent. All of that was given. His eyes were open. He reflected on all of that. And he's praying and asking God to do these things. But then he confesses sins. Now listen, when he confesses the sins, what I want you to see here is he says, he says, um, I pray before you now day and night for the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel. But then he says, which we have sinned against you. We have sinned against you. In other words, that means that he was confessing sins of Israel and including himself in that sin. He was including himself in that he too was a sinner, in that he too was part of all this, and he was confessing his sin. He wasn't confessing and saying, you know, I've been up here in Babylon, and I know that they've been messing up over there, so I want to confess their sin before you on their behalf. 
He wasn't saying that. He was saying, I want to confess the sin. We know what's been happening, and we confess it before you. We have done it. I'm part of it. I'm confessing it. I'm pouring out upon that. That humility that we talked about Sunday when we talked about confessing and having that, that's what it means is to literally come to that point. And so he absolutely confessed openly his sin. He confessed his sin, and he confessed the house, his father's sin. He confessed all of that because he said, we have acted very corruptly against you. So he put himself in his father's house by saying, we. So he's realized that God is calling something important to happen. His heart has been broken. He's pouring himself out. He's been praying. He's been fasting. God has convicted him. Now he's confessing the sin, not only of the people, but of himself. He's confessing all of that. So now, after all of these things, now he's getting ready to be used. You see, these are things that we skip. Well, I think this is what needs to happen, so God, I'm ready, whatever you want me to do. Are you ready? Have you humbled yourself? Have you poured yourself out before God? Have you had him lay you bare so that you can your sins can be seen? Have you been convicted and, and confessed all of those and prepared yourself ready to go serve God? Think of it like this. In the day of the king, when there was a king and somebody would come before the king, did they just come in off the street after a hard day's work and walk in to see the king? They had to prepare themselves to go see the king. They had to get washed and cleaned and put on clean clothes and get all um, you know, dressed up and everything before they went in to see the king. They had to prepare themselves before they went to see the king. Well, God wants us to prepare ourselves too. He wants us to prepare ourselves by getting all that dirty off of us, the sins that we have, confess all of those things and be cleansed before we come before him to do whatever it is that he has for us to do. Listen, we got to get rid of all this stuff before we can go forward. I, I saw a word picture done one time and it was talking about somebody who said they were ready to um, serve God. And they had a pack on their back that was, you know, a mile high and hanging all over them. They had all this stuff and they come up before uh, and they stand before uh, what's supposed to be God and said, okay, I'm ready, load it up. Well, they couldn't possibly carry another thing because they had all of this on them. And everything that was loaded up on them, you know what it was? Sin. So they had so much sin that they were carrying around and loaded up and, and, and falling down to the ground. They couldn't possibly serve God in the way they needed to because they were burdened down with sin. Nehemiah was burdened with sin not only for himself but for the people. And he confessed that sin before God. He prayed, he fasted, he prepared all of those things so that he might be able to serve God. That he might be able to do that. Look with me to verses 8 through 10. Remember, I pray the word that you commanded to your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, Though some of you were cast out to the farthest part of the heavens, yet I will gather them from there and bring them to the place which I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. Now, these are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. All right, so we look at this. What do we see? Nehemiah says, remember, he's going to God and he's saying, God, remember what you promised? Remember what you promised? You know what's a, one of the most powerful ways you can pray? Is pray God's promises. God, you remember what you promised? You promised that even if your people turned their back on you and they did all these things, that they, even though they'd be scattered into all the nations, if they turned back to you and confessed, you would bring them back. You would bring them back. He's saying, you remember, God, that you did that? He quoted from that's the part that he quoted about the promise to Moses is in Leviticus and Deuteronomy. In Psalm, God says to his people, open your mouth wide and I will fill it. God will not open his storehouses until you open your mouth. You open your mouth to perform his promises. When you begin to do that, think about it like this. When um, um, Joshua was getting ready to cross over the Jordan River and all the raging water and everything that happened, they said, told the priest, step your feet into the water until the priest actually put his foot in the water and nothing happened. When the priest finally put his foot in the water, all the water parted 
It piled up and they went across on dry ground. They made that step and God fulfilled what he told them he was going to do. God says, if you will do this, then I'm going to do this for you. But it depends on you being willing to do what God told you to do. Are you willing to do that? If you return to me and keep my commandments, Nehemiah said, listen, it's conditional promise. God said, if you return to me and keep my commandments, then I will bring you back to myself. We have to be willing to do those things in order to get what God promised us in the first place. Lastly, look at verse 11. O Lord, I pray, please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who desire uh, to fear your name and let your servant prosper this day. I pray and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. So what do we see in verse 11? Prayer, again, it's essential. Prayer is something that he's continuing to do. Prayer is the thing that we see constantly that we have to continue on. He says, Lord, I pray. I pray. Grant him mercy. He asked God to bless him because he was soon going to speak to the king about the matter. That's why he was asking God to bless him. He said, let your servant prosper. He's prayer, a man of prayer, but he's also a man of action. You see, the whole thing is sometimes we pray, but we're not willing to act. We're not willing to take that step. Nehemiah was getting ready to take that step, and he's praying that God would give grant mercy and that he would let his servant prosper. Basically, his prayer is, use me to make it better. Use me to make it better. Now listen, that's the amazing thing. When we stop and think about all that goes on in our world today, everything that's happened, all the places that, that things are going on, the uh, the negatives that we have in the world today, how many times have we stopped and said, God, I know that this is a terrible situation. It needs to be better. Would you use me to make it better? I'm, I'm here. God, I'm ready for you to use me. Would you use me to make it better? The whole point that I want you to see in this first chapter of Nehemiah is the book is about leadership, but the leader had to be prepared beforehand. The one that, that his heart was broken, God moved him to something, but he didn't move him to just have a broken heart for it. He moved him to have a broken heart for it, convicted him of his sin so that he confessed and was cleansed and prepared him to be used for it. And Nehemiah said, I'm ready. Use me. I'm ready. So the question for all of us is, are you ready? Number one, are you willing? If you're willing, are you ready? The only way you can be ready is if you, in fact, have poured your heart out before God, laid open your heart, confessed everything, and asked God to prepare you for whatever task it is that you believe he's put in front of you, whatever that might be. So for all of us, we need to do that. We're going to see how God used Nehemiah in some amazing ways. It took four months from the time that he started praying before he ever began the task. Here's the amazing thing. Preparation took four months before he ever did it. You know how long it took to build the wall? 52 days. 52 days. Wasn't even two months it took to actually build the wall, but it took four months to get prepared to do it. All right? So let's be thinking about that. We'll pick it up again next week. Um, so uh, join us next week. We'll pick up Chapter 2 of Nehemiah. Um, for those of you who are joining us online tonight, again, we're so glad that you joined in. Look forward to seeing you again next week. Um, those of you that are here tonight, we're going to be starting our business meeting in just a moment. But for those of you online, I want to say to you, uh, before you depart, God bless and good night.